I'm going to begin, I, I'm going to actually circulate this through the audience, and as my talk goes on, you'll you realize why. Don't worry about it, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's valuable, but not rare. Not rare and not particularly valuable. It's interesting. It's uh, the first edition of Buchan's Domestic Medicine. It's in a library binding, so it's easily handled. And it was published here in Edinburgh in 1769 and hugely outsold the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, which I will talk about. And it was edited and printed by William Smelly. So, as many of you already know, 2018 will see the 250th anniversary of the publication of the first edition of the Britannica on the 10th of December, to be precise, the day when the initial issue was distributed to subscribers and booksellers here in Edinburgh and elsewhere in Scotland and the north of England. That event will be internationally feted later this year and into 2019 in Edinburgh at the National Library of Scotland in London at the British Library in Washington, D.C., at the Library of Congress, and in Chicago, now the world headquarters for the Encyclopedia Britannica. But there was really not much to celebrate when the Britannica made its first appearance. There was nothing at its advent to suggest that it would evolve into the world's leading reference work, whose multiple editions would become the repositories for articles authored by the best minds of the succeeding generations. So why such an inauspicious beginning? Let me take you back to Edinburgh in the autumn of 1768, to a typically cold and wet Monday evening in late November. Midnight is approaching, and with it, the promised launch of a much anticipated work. We gather in stair clothes, just across the corner, right? Outside the printing office of Colin McFarquhar, son of a wig maker. We stand jesting, gossiping, and warming ourselves among a group of young servants sent to collect their employer's subscription copy of part one, volume one, of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the first such compilation in English to use the term encyclopedia. We have gathered at this spot for several evenings now over the previous fortnight, only to be turned away on each occasion by McFarquhar's apprentice the disappointing news that the Britannica launch has been delayed. So home we go, to various wines and clothes, or back here to the National. On the Wednesday after our fool's errand, the Edinburgh papers will announce that the encyclopedia is still to be forthcoming, with a new date of the 6th of December, which itself will not be met. So why these delays? To answer that question, we must visit two other 18th century Edinburgh workplaces. The first is Andrew Bell's premises in Parliament Square, where he designed and executed the engravings for the Britannica. His efforts had been forestalled in the summer of 1768 when he determined that the octavo format, and it's an octavo you are now or will be holding in your hands, not that, format for the encyclopedia would not accommodate the intricacy of the plates intended to illustrate the long article on anatomy, requiring a new proposal to be circulated to subscribers and advertised in the newspapers for an edition in three quarto volumes, still much smaller than the folios of the Britannica's two chief competitors, Diderot's Encyclopédie, begun in 1751, completed in 17 volumes by 1766, and sold by John Balter here in Edinburgh, and Chambers' Cyclopedia, first published in 1728 and continued through a dozen 18th century editions, including one that competed head to head with the 1768 Britannica. But Bell was not the problem. Although he had to re engrave a number of plates, he met his November deadline. Now, the first image in front of you is the, one of the surviving copies of that second proposal. None survive of the first for the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Newspaper advertisements and partial proposals in the newspapers are there, but that's it. Telling people that, unfortunately, that Octavo was too small to accommodate the engraving so it would be delayed so they could use a quarto. If you look at the display case on the way out, you will see that even the quarto 
for the Britannica is much smaller than Voltaire's encyclopedia, and Chambers' folio was the same size. So what they were attempting was really to miniaturize the format and still keep the content as detailed as possible. And it was going to prove an impossible task in Otago, a difficult one in Quarto. So, we continue our investigation by crossing the high street and entering Morocco Crows, where we find the printing house of Old and Smelly, and William Smelly himself, hard at work, not on the encyclopedia, of which he was the handsomely paid sole editor, much better remunerated than Diderot had been, and not even on the firm's struggling newspaper, but rather delightfully immersed in rewriting William Buchan's manuscript for the domestic medicine whose publication deadline overlapped with the Britannica and whose subject matter and audience especially appealed to Smelly's own interests in medicine. The book would vastly outpace the Britannica when it also appeared in 1769. Its 5,000 copy first run sold out in less than three months. A typical run was 1,500 copies. But, uh, while the Britannica never managed to sell anything close to the 3,000 copies which Constable speculates were printed by 1771. And because of its accessible, jargon-free prose, the result of Smelly's rewriting of Buchan's original manuscript, the domestic medicine became the first reliable public guide to personal health and the most widely circulated medical book in English for over 100 years with 14 editions, as well as pirated reprints in America and Ireland. Smelly's obsession with comprehending and demystifying medical theory and practice, and his desire to increase the general reading public's understanding of their own bodies and the basics of healthy living, led to the medical articles in the encyclopedia being some of the longest and most controversial, with their accompanying engravings more detailed, precise, and abundant than for any other subject. As we shall shortly see, the detours and delays in executing and completing the Britannica may all be traced to Smelly's original concept for the encyclopedia and his stubborn character. And so we wait throughout the autumn of 1768 for that man in Morocco close to complete his obsessively long article on anatomy. In fact, the first two letters of the alphabet in that first edition of the Britannica would take up the whole of volume one and more than one third of the encyclopedia's total pages, with Smelly compelled to fit the rest of the alphabet and its articles and entries into the remaining two volumes. <laughs> but, uh, no, honestly, if, if I had a week, I couldn't go into enough detail about this man's inability to stay to a schedule follow a design, make money and keep it, make friends and keep them. <laughs> when McFarquhar does at last distribute part one of the Britannica to his subscribers and Edinburgh's booksellers on the 10th of December, while it must have been a relief, it was not a proud day for the publishers, nor a happy one for the purchasers. After all, that first installment was weeks late months, according to an early proposal which had appeared in Edinburgh's newspapers on the 1st of August in 1767, fell many pages and entries short of expectations and was met with rancor and disappointment, even ridicule, by its initial readers. In fact, William Smelly engaged in a rather heated exchange with disgruntled purchasers in a series of letters and, uh, and an editorial in the Capital's four newspapers at the time, the Edinburgh Evening Courant, the Caledonian Mercury, the Edinburgh Advertiser, and the Edinburgh Weekly Chronicle, which he himself was editing and publishing. Smelly eventually subdued his critics in the press, ascribing their complaints to, and this is a quote, the general quackery of the age, and insisting that his objective as editor was to devise a library under one continuous title that would be sufficient to allow any individual to make himself master of any science whatever through his own private study. It was a genuinely egalitarian ambition that assumed the necessity, even the obligation of democratizing access to knowledge, a principle that Smelly would champion during the contentious establishment of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. 
It's relevant to our topic today to note that of the small group of invitees who actually joined Lord Buckham in forming the Scottish Antiquaries, fully a third were members of the book trade, including prominently William Creech, John Balfour, James Donaldson, and William Smellick. Still, the Britannica's publication schedule was vexed by irregularity for some six months. Advertisements for the encyclopedia promised new issues to follow sequentially every week. But this never happened, with any consistency at least, until October 1769, by which time Smelly had completed his rewrite, edit, and the printing of that domestic medicine, which was published in September 1769, and had resigned, and he by that time had also resigned his partnership with William Old, and with it from the onerous editorship and printing of their joint newspaper. So now he could concentrate on the encyclopedia. Still, that first Britannica, issued in 100 parts through 1771, would struggle, both financially and critically, eventually being sold to London publishers who would repackage it in 1771 and 1775, 1773 rather, and 1775. A failure? Yes and no. It is doubtful that the copyright holders of that first edition, the printer Colin McFarquhar and the engraver Andrew Bell, made much of a profit beyond the 200 pounds they paid Smelly to compile and edit their first Britannica. Although later editions, especially the third as marketed by the innovative Edinburgh publisher Charles Eliot, who understood advertising and distribution, he'd read his Adam Smith, would make both McFarquhar and Bell wealthy men. When Bell inherited McFarquhar's share of the Britannica, it amounted to 42,000 pounds. And how can we deem the first edition a failure when it established the model for the Britannica brand? As to William Smelling, well, he seemed to have a knack throughout his career from his apprentice days with the printing bookhouse firm of Balfour, Hamilton, and Neal in the 1750s through to the publication of his philosophy of natural history in 1790 of displaying genius, but also attracting self-defeating controversy. Charles Eliot had guaranteed Smelly a thousand guineas that, uh, for the philosophy of natural history in 1788, a sum almost unheard of, unheard of at that time for an unwritten work. But when Eliot died suddenly, Smelly's then partner, the litigious William Creech, put a lien on the payment out of spite over what he perceived as Smelly's betrayal of him during the printing of the Deacon Brody trial. Smelly would, I think, be much better known, even celebrated today, had he not been so determined to confront the gatekeepers of knowledge in medicine, law, natural history, and the emerging social sciences. His battle with Lord Mombato is legendary. Smelly believed that any knowledge that was useful to improving the human condition should be available equally to all citizens. And he included women, as his correspondence with Mariah Riddell in the 1790s demonstrates. He also suggested that women be given equal access with men to the Society of Antiquaries lectures and museum in exchanges with the Society Secretary, James Cumming. Now, let me just show you, I can get this to go. Oh, great. Just three images of Smelly. This one is uh, by John Brown, who did a number of sketches of this sort of the founding members of the society. It was gifted to the society in 1782 and is now with the uh, National Gallery. This is by uh, George Watson. It's probably the most moving and it certainly is the most copied portrait of Smelly. Uh, Watson was his son-in-law you know, and a founding member of the Royal Scottish Academy, and a very fine painter in his own right. And this is, has been copied all through the 19th century, often for frontispieces, for works associated with Smelling and others. And the third I want to show you in my favorite. <laughs> there he is, John Kai. I mean, honestly, and there, there's Andrew Bell, and uh, the particularly handsome man on the side there. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, William Smelly, slightly taller, facing him. You know, two of uh, the characters of Edinburgh. It's remarkable to think that the, the, the wealth of our knowledge 
of the light in Edinburgh comes from caricatures, and I think that's a grand thing. There's all those wonderful portraits, you know, by Rayburn and Ramsey and others. But what's the point of a glorious celebration of Hume and all of his wonderful rep when you can get a lovely cartoon of him and see who he really was? I, I know that thing on the mound seems to be a mismatched marriage, <laughs> no, of the serious and the buffoonery. But, but I think these are extraordinary things and a, and a real gift and an accident. You know, they were done individually and sold in the 1780s out of uh, John Kay's uh, barber shop and then collected up into a wonderful volume in the uh, early 19th century. But that's my favorite, Smelly. And uh, the soon to be, you know, the financial equivalent of, uh, you know, of uh, our, our current you know, uh, you know, owners of things like Amazon and uh, Microsoft in terms of his wealth. Smelly was born into a family of distinguished stonemasons, with both his father and his grandfather achieving the status of master builder and deacon of the trade. His grandfather was also a leading figure in the Freemasons, an originally Scottish institution promoting the arts and sciences, thus the nomenclature speculative Freemasonry, and the principal equality among men of all social standing. Thus, the role of Freemasonry in, in promoting revolution, politically, socially, and intellectually in the 18th century throughout Europe and America. Free Masonic lodges where the, discussion, where the discussion of religion was prohibited provided Scottish men of all ranks with a secure space to meet and share ideas away from the repression of the Church of Scotland. When King James VI initiated the practice of speculative masonry, he established a forum for secular learning that covertly challenged the Presbyterian Church. Smelly was born in the Pleasance, again, not far from here, and raised a Cameronian, perhaps the most severe of the Presbyterian sects. As Covenanters, they were politically suspect in Edinburgh, and Smelly's earliest memories are his recollections of being carried by his father into the Pentlands to worship in secrecy during the Jacobite uprising. His father had a deep distrust of government and as a result did not register the births of any of his children. His beliefs, what we might call today a form of socialism, led him to decline the inheritance of extensive family holdings in the, Ple in the Pleasance, including a tenement, a loss of wealth that Smelly attempted to reclaim unsuccessfully in the 1780s. Smelly inherited his father's attitude toward authority and followed his grandfather into Freemasonry, embracing its commitment to the utility of learning to social improvement. But his father's distrust of the ruling classes and their political power encouraged in Smelly a disposition that would lead to his eventual downfall in an Edinburgh still dependent upon patronage. A curious fact about Smelly, he never ventured beyond <coughs> Edinburgh any further than its surrounding villages. His commitment to the capital was such that he turned down lucrative opportunities to join book trade partners in London, including an invitation to become a full printing partner to William Strang, one of the 18th century's most successful publishers. His only overnight journey was to Dumfries in 1794 at the invitation of his uh, close friend and intellectual confidant, the naturalist and poet, Maria Riddell, in order to spend a few days with another dear friend and confidant, Robert Burns. Among the founders of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, um, let's say diverse group to be polite, as opposed to James Boswell's less kind phrase, he referred to them as Lord Buchan's congregation of wiseacres. Uh, so maybe you want Take your hand down now, if Jeffrey asks us again. Unless you're proud to be a wiseacre, because after all, you're bald, short, and not particularly attractive. So yes, wiseacre, anything that distinguishes me. But, uh, and and Smelly's very public desk up with Professor John Robinson embarrassed Bucket and the society's aristocratic allies, almost cost the antiquaries their royal charter. More of that later. This was an especially dramatic instance of Smelly's belief that scientific knowledge belonged to the public at large and should not be ring-fenced by professional or academic institutions. 
His Society of Antiquaries was dedicated to the benefit and enlightenment of all society. The medical articles in the first Britannica, and in particular William Buchan's Domestic Medicine, which we have heard, Smelly substantially rewrote and edited from the manuscript as well as printed, were both attacked by the medical faculty at Edinburgh for disseminating privileged information without proper regard to the medical authorities uh, who insisted upon proprietorship over that knowledge. For Smelly, there could be no copyright on knowledge that would improve lives and cultivate sensibilities. When one considers the extent to which Smelly's career and his family's social and financial security depended upon the patronage of the Lords Kames, Hales, Monbado, and Buchan, as well as the banker Forbes, Enlightenment Edinburgh was not egalitarian. His persistent, ethically motivated independence of mind must strike us as a remarkable trait. Among his many attainments, Smelly was Edinburgh's most respected printer, an award-winning botanist, and a natural historian whose seminal work influenced Darwin and became Harvard University's standard textbook on the subject for 50 years in the 19th century in an edition first prepared by Dr. John Ware in 1822 for a course at Harvard which was affectionately nicknamed after Smelly. He was a legal commentator whose pamphlet arguing that juries had the right, indeed the responsibility, to ignore directives from the bench and decide issues of the law for themselves. And he was an editor of medical collections and journals, including the Thesaurus Medicus and Duncan's Medical Commentaries, and the printer of all the medical theses and legal dissertations for Edinburgh University for some 35 years, as well as a member of both the Royal and the Antiquary Societies of Edinburgh. But beyond all this, Smelly was also arguably Scotland's first true journalist, and that's my turning point today, a vocation for which his outsider status socially, his critical acumen, and intrinsic distrust of authority well suited him. Despite his prominent place in Edinburgh's 18th century intellectual community, he was a close associate of Henry Hume, John Dalrymple, William Robertson, Thomas Blacklock, Gilbert Stewart, James Hutton, and Joseph Black, as well as the author of biographies based upon his own intimate knowledge of Adam Smith, David Hume, and Dr. John Gregory. Smelly's only significant contributions to the high literature of the Scottish Enlightenment are his philosophy of natural history, completed late in his life with the second volume appearing posthumously and the first volume translated into German, Russian, and Danish within a year of its publication, and his translation of Buffon's natural history. Important works, but a modest canon, especially when compared to his considerable output of political pamphlets and prefaces newspaper and magazine compilations and editorships, reviews and essays, all ephemeral efforts of the kind that would come to define journalism in a later period. Indeed, he was hired by Bell and McFarquhar to edit the Britannica as much, if not more, for his experiences with serial publications, two newspapers, and what was at the time Scotland's only monthly magazine, as for its intellectual acumen. In the 17-year period between 1759 and 1776, Smelly took a leading part in the production of four Edinburgh newspapers and magazines, all of which were pioneering efforts in different and significant ways. The Edinburgh Chronicle, 1759 to 1760, the Scots Magazine, 1760 to 1765, uh, the Edinburgh Weekly Chronicle, 1765 to 1769, and the Ag Edinburgh Magazine and Review, 1773 to 1776. His only sabbatical from journalism occurred in 1770 to 1772, when he was engaged as a compiler and contributing editor to the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I will argue that as a serial publication, which was conceived to convey to the general public information useful to their daily life, the Britannica, as imagined by Smelly, and his engraver, Andrew Bell, was closer in form and purpose to the Scots or the gentlemen's magazines than it was to either Diderot's Encyclopedia or Ephraim Chambers's Encyclopedia. 
when Smelly saw a bound volume of the Scots magazine, he saw a prototype for his Britannica, where the formidable folio encyclopedias produced in Paris and London, each volume weighing as much as 10 pounds, required the support of library stands and tables to be opened and read. Smelly would propose that the Britannica be printed as an octavo, now which you're handling. The format favored by magazines, texts that could be held easily in one's hand. The Britannica thus was conceived to do what no other encyclopedia maker had ever done, to place useful knowledge in the hands of the public, quite literally, as you were now handling his edition of Buchan's Domestic Medicine. Smelly, Bell, and McFarquhar no doubt also anticipated that such a design would make the Britannica more affordable. Bell had been the principal engraver for the Scots magazine for several years before Smelly became the magazine's editor in 1760 and would be conscious of the additional, even prohibitive, expense of printing folio engravings. His joint efforts with Smelly in producing 12 issues of the Scots magazine annually for six years provided a testing ground for exploring the challenges in publishing an encyclopedia with the Scots magazine itself, as we shall shortly see, eventually becoming one of two prototypes for the Britannica. Smelly's contract as editor of the Scots magazine, which survives among his manuscripts in the archives of the Society of Antiquaries up here at the National Museum, sets out his employer's expectations. That's the contract there. It's the only contract we have for anyone editing an 18th century magazine. So until the 19th century, we have no idea if there actually were editors, if the printers were doing it. I'll give you the little bits of it. If you would, can, if you, of course, you won't be able to read it off the screen even if we zoom a bit. So it's quite a remarkable document. And it sets out his, uh, no, the, his employer's expectations of them, which are down in that lower paragraph. I'll read them for you here. Collecting articles for a magazine, making abstracts, extracts, or transcripts, writing accounts, and in cases of hurry of printing, in composing, or casework. His contractual responsibilities were to prepare Smelly well for what he would later describe as the scissors and paste job of compiling the Britannica. <laughs> and, and he wasn't being insulting. Want to, this was decidedly not Diderot's encyclopedia. In his encyclopedia, Smelly would follow the practice among 18th century magazines and newspapers of lifting much of their content, even letters to the editor, from a handful of London publications, which equally cannibalized one another and the Scots magazine in turn. Such borrowings, without acknowledgement, were seldom considered theft of intellectual property because, after all, no one holds a copyright on the news. And the news quickly loses its print value from day to day and issue to issue. Today's newspaper is tomorrow's trash. Magazines have a longer life, and subscribers were expected to bind the magazine's issues annually into a comprehensive volume for future reference, replacing the originally ephemeral paper cover with respectively enduring leather. As an inducement, the publishers provided subscribers with title pages, additional engravings, indices, and a yearly appendix or supplementary volume, with the latter eventually becoming a recurring feature of the Britannica. Full runs of 18th century magazines are not uncommon today, unlike 18th century newspapers, because magazines were considered to be reference books, and as such, were an essential part of any serious library. As the Scots magazine observed on the cover of its May 1754 number, here it is here. I mean, that cyber says advertising. That's what a blue wrapper would be. You get your magazine like that. That would be the cover. And it would have advertisements, sometimes bits of articles. At the end of your, your binder would tear all those off and bind them together in leather with a table of contacts and an index. Sadly, it means that a lot of interesting information has been lost because last minute stuff was stuck on those covers. It wasn't necessarily reprinted in the next issue. But, uh, but still, but, uh, here, the Scots Magazine in 1754, and if you can just zoom in a bit on that top paragraph, we might see it, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. But uh, uh, it says on that wrapper, 
of magazines. Newspapers are usually thrown away, the Scots magazine says, but magazines are kept in order to be bound and their content thus endures. They were trying to get more advertisers anyway by saying, you know, people keep their magazine around all year. So you're getting 12 months out of your three shilling investment with us, you know, to, or your thoughtless investment with us as opposed to a newspaper. But it also implied the staying power of the magazine itself. Right? You know so it is reasonable to surmise that Smelly and Bell editor and engraver for the Scots magazine would look to that format at hand, an octavo format, as the model for their proposed encyclopedia. And that was what they laid out in their first advertisement for subscribers to the Britannica in Edinburgh's newspapers late in 1766, and again in March 1767. The advert describes a proposed work titled A New and Complete Dictionary of the Arts and Sciences to be illustrated above 300 copper plates exhibiting several thousand figures accurately engraved, printed in octavo and issued in parts. But Smelly and Bell had a second model in mind for their project, the title of which they borrowed for that proposal in these first advertisements before eventually settling on Encyclopedia Britannica. Smelly had identified this second model, an English reference work, and it's out in the case there it has its tree of knowledge folded out. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. An octavo published in 1754 at London by William Owen and reissued by him in the same size in 1763. And in the Scots Magazine in 1762, Smelly printed Owen's 12-page 1754 preface just inside that blue cover, facing his own title page. He, he, he placed it. And what's more important, he included that folio size printout of the Tree of Knowledge, which would have been extraordinarily expensive. And he commissioned Bell to re-engrave it, because at the foot of that it says, you know, it has there in its Latin engraved by Andrew Bell. Remarkable investment for no apparent reason. Huh? But, um, but uh, it, 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 it smelled as editor of the Scots, added his own brief preamble to Owens's preface in which he observes that Owen's description of his dictionary, and here's the quotation, will, it is hoped, be thought a proper beginning for a volume of this collection, a work meaning the Scots magazine, calculated to promote knowledge and inspire the reader with the love of it. Smelly continues to justify his inclusion of Owen's preface by arguing that the survey falls properly with a material article of our plan in the Scots magazine that of giving an account of books. The first edition of the Britannica would itself be just a more exhaustive account of books, just excerpts cut and pasted together. In 1762, Smelly relocates a much expanded books department from the back of the middle, from the back to the middle of the Scots magazine, with significantly increasing the magazine's medical articles, and reviews of medical books, eventually creating a section of the magazine dedicated to medicine. This, too, will carry over into the Britannica's commitment to medical articles. You see Smelly all the way through his editing of the Scots magazine, experimenting with things that are going to define the Britannica. Smelly's improvements of the Scots magazine and his experiences as editor did much to shape his ideas for the Britannica. Owens's complete dictionary started Smelly thinking about the Scots magazine itself as a sort of encyclopedia, simply one without an alphabetical terminus. If a serious magazine could be encyclopedic in its intellectual ambitions, why couldn't an encyclopedia emulate the practices of a magazine in its production and distribution? After all, both had similar origins in that they were sold in parts, protected by paper wrappers, and only bound once those parts have been accumulated into prescribed volumes. Subscribers in both instances would be issued title pages and supporting matter, such as prefaces, tables of content, and indices, but only when they had purchased complete volumes. And single issues could be bought at any time. Yes, you could purchase an encyclopedia complete, bound and ready for your library without collecting it part by part, but magazines were also sold in trade bindings, as complete volumes and sets, 
and often available through backstock catalogs years after their first appearance in parts. To Smelly, the difference was one of status, not production, and certainly not utility. Owen's complete dictionary of the arts and sciences no doubt confirmed Smelly in his decision to attempt to produce a genuinely encyclopedic work in octavo format a format that was large enough to co be comprehensive, but small enough to enable its easy distribution and to make its utility as a reference work more ready to hand, so to speak, than its elephantine French cousin. Smelly may even have taken from Owen's title page the phrase, by a society of gentlemen, which he uses in the proposal and, at the end of the, and, at the, uh, and on the title page of the Britannica as a silvercut for authorship. Now, it is crucial to observe that no single entry in Owen's four-volume complete dictionary runs to more than a brief paragraph. He offers definitions only, whereas Smelly had imagined somehow fitting whole treatises, some running over 100 pages into, in quarto, 100 pages in quarto, into his Octavo Britannica. And that was never going to happen. You know that? Utility and applicability were hallmarks of Smelly's efforts in journalism. His 1784 pamphlet on the power of juries drew upon the best legal authorities from Stair through Blackstone and Erskine with a nod to Mackenzie, but grounded all of its citations empirically and personally in Smelly's own experiences as a juryman and used contentious recent cases and decisions to make the point that jurymen should trust themselves to make informed decisions and should have the intellectual liberty to challenge even a law lord when reason urged them to do so. The pamphlet was twice reprinted in the 19th century and quoted during the sedition trials. One of the most distinctive treatises in the First Britannica is its article on Scots law. For Smelly, the law is useful only in its applications, however interesting in its theoretical disputations. Understanding the function of Scott's law was vital to Smelly's notion of encyclopedic knowledge because it was a practical necessity for anyone who wished to take responsibility for themselves in an enlightened civil society. And as a businessman, often involved with lawsuits, Smelly knew well how fundamental an understanding of the law was in Adam Smith's commercial world. His own newspaper advertisement for his pamphlet on the power of juries appeared under the proclamation in italics, countrymen beware. For Smelly, to be informed was to be forewarned and to be forewarned was to be protected against ignorance and the usurpation of natural rights. His engagement with encyclopedia making, like his commitment to journalism, was a political act of public education, enlightenment as liberation, in highlighting Scots law with an emphasis on how it differed from the law of England, Smelly was reasserting the explicitly nationalist mandate of the Edinburgh Chronicle, the first newspaper with which he was associated, and that of the Scots Magazine, both of which gave pride of place to matters of Scottish identity and achievement in the arts and sciences, with the objective of raising pride among Scots and drawing the attention of English readers, especially in London, to Scotland's intellectual and literary attainments. Thus, while the title of the Britannica explicitly confirms its commitment to the values of the Union, not unlike James Thomson's poem, its content consistently addresses Scottish identity within the Union and Scotland's significant contributions to defining the notion of Britain. It was a clever double act. Smalley wrote two prefaces for the first Britannica, one for the Edinburgh and another for the later London editions. Those London editions bearing imprints of Edward and Charles Dilly in 1773 and the Scot John Donaldson in 1775 were identical to the Edinburgh text. Uh, but you know, they, uh, however similar, you know, they, Smelly's prefaces were. I'm going to skip a bit here for time. But uh, when the Britannic was completed in three volumes, he wrote a preface that opens by asserting this. Utility ought to be the principal intention of every publication. It is a precept that Smelly took in part from Keynes's Elements of Criticism, whose first edition he saw through the press, having commented critically on the manuscript. 
and it would be Smalley's primary concern as a book reviewer for the Edinburgh Magazine and Review, and to this day, it remains the proud motto of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Utility ought to be the principal intention of every publication. Smalley further observes in his preface that the publishers of the first Britannica venture to affirm that any man of ordinary parts may, if he chooses, learn the principles of agriculture, of astronomy, of botany, of chemistry, etc., 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 he writes, from the Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a bold assertion and one that challenges the institutional authority of the universities and their professors. This deeply held belief stayed with Smelly throughout his life and was the motivation behind his insistence upon establishing a program of public lectures as part of the mandate for the nascent Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. He had secured Lord Buchan's reluctant support for such a venture and began to plan in 1781 for a series of lectures on natural history that he would deliver as part of the Society's annual program. Now, the university immediately resisted. And the principal, Robertson, wrote to Buck and saying he would do everything in his power to stop the charter if this went ahead. So Buck, who had originally backed Smelly, wrote him a letter. But, uh, and here's Buck, oh, I've got one of these. This is down here. Honestly, even if you had it in front of you, you'd need a magnifying glass to pull it apart. He had compelled Smelly to draft an apology and note of reconciliation to Professor Robinson. He then writes here to him, Buckham, smiling, he says, very good, this is nicely done, I made a few corrections. Now, please write out a fair copy and sign it and send it to me and I will keep it on record, he says, as a testimony to your candor. And thus, the society got its charter. Uh, Buckham was really, really, what will we say? There's two D words. They both fit. Dilettante and duplicitous. He, he, you just could not trust the man, and he just hung Smelly out to dry. Now, if it had left a Smelly, we wouldn't have been putting our hands up today because there would have been no bloody charter, that's for sure. But it was that matter, and he insisted. He wanted to give public lectures, allowing women access at the, on the principles of natural history that would eventually become his book in opposition to those given at the university to take it right outside the walls. Now that, I'm going to just um, skip a little bit of the discussion of the his second preface. The question appears if it comes up, I'll move to it. And just sum up, by going back to that title, it may have induced you to come and you're wondering where it went about Wikipedia. Right? William Smiley lived during the first information revolution. And as a printer, he was the IT specialist of his day. As a writer, he helped to evolve two of the principal information highways of the Enlightenment, journalism and the encyclopedia. We are living in the second information revolution. And as printing presses have given way to word processors, we should not be surprised to have witnessed the demise of the two forms of print media that Smelly pioneered. Newspapers and encyclopedias were unique products of print and the Enlightenment. Shakespeare never handled either. They were the preeminent data machines of their day, spreading the news, informing, educating, and inspiring literacy. Thomas Carlyle's father famously learned to read so that he could follow the Napoleonic campaigns in the newspapers. Fake news and alternative facts were always the bane of these two genres. But Smelly was one of those early technicians who strove to establish integrity in journalism and reliability in encyclopedias. Just as news is ever-changing, so facts constantly evolve. The news ages, and encyclopedias become obsolete. What Bell, McFarquhar, and Smelly recognized was the built-in obsolescence of the genre. And along with Charles Eliot, later in the century, they began the Britannica's inspired practice of regular renewal. Not just reprinting, but actually re-examining and recommissioning everything in the successive volumes. But, uh, there was profit in this, obviously, but no free press without free markets. Renew the product, refresh the market. 
Apple has mastered the first generation, what the first generation of the Britannic intuited. Adam Smith must be smiling. And both are the engineers of handheld technologies, phones and books. Smelly brought to his vocation as a writer a deep belief in the natural right of every free citizen to have access to whatever they needed to know to prosper and take responsibility for themselves. Literacy liberates, and liberation demands to know what has previously been prohibited. Wikipedia, for all its faults, embodies that principle today. In this age of citizen journalism, another innovation of the Protestant Enlightenment, Wikipedia is the medium of citizen encyclopedia making. Anonymous and still at times unreliable, Wikipedia in its current infancy is not unlike that first Britannica, criticized for its misinformation and written by that faceless society of gentlemen. Access to the news is essential to transparency in government, and access to knowledge is essential to self-improvement. The liberty to learn is a natural right and the essence of democracy. Social justice requires every citizen to have the means to Google the facts with the touch of the finger. Smelly wanted his citizens to have the freedom to look them up in a book they could hold in their hands. And that was revolutionary. Thanks.